Today I wanted to look at a topic that's uh, pretty interesting to me. And I want to begin by looking at Matthew chapter 24, and verse 36. Matthew 24 and verse 36. This is Christ speaking here. It says, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But he says, But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came, and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So, so this right here, the story of Noah and the flood, you know, Christ talks about it here, is uh, probably one of my favorite parts of Genesis. One of my favorite parts of Genesis. Uh, We've, uh, we had some great sermons that Wesley White gave about Noah that I was really excited about, and they were really interesting uh, histories about Noah. And uh, I really like Noah. I have, a, I have a painting in my office, which was in my home before I moved here, uh, called The Celebration, which is uh, Noah after the ark is uh, set. And uh, so I really like that, pa that painting because maybe it just kind of gives you a real view of the ark, and uh, I was pretty excited when I heard that they were they were making a Noah movie. <laughs> I was pretty excited about that. And so the movie Noah that I saw was pretty bad. <laughs> and uh, again, not accurate, of course, right? Not accurate, of course. But theologically, it was really, really, really removed from the reason why there was a flood. If anybody who's anybody see the movie here, a couple people saw it. It's really, really, really different. I watched the Ten Commandments the other day, and the uh, maybe the, the first two and a half hours of the Ten Commandments. You ever seen that movie, Ten Commandments? All four and a half hours or whatever it is. The first two and a half hours of that movie is basically what fluff. Because, uh, you know, so much goes on in that movie that's not even in the Bible, right? It's like, like, it was like the, I was watching the first two and a half. I was like, I don't remember any of this. I look and maybe like a paragraph, and they got two and a half hours of drama and different things. So I guess when they make movies, uh, a lot of times maybe they're not so accurate. Uh, but at least for me, I guess the, the, the movie to Ten Commandments, it was accurate in that Maybe it has some of the theological things. Quite, maybe right, you know, from what I remember. I didn't. I didn't really watch the other day because it is it is quite kind of long. So Aronofsky, who was the director of Noah, he referred to Noah as the least biblical biblical film ever made. And he used the word biblical twice in the quote. I guess the director meant that the, the movie Noah was unlike any other previously made religious film in a, maybe in a cinematic sense and feel. Uh, Paramount Pictures, uh, they released a statement about the movie and they said, the film is inspired by the story of Noah and the message reads, while the artistic license has been taken, we believe that this film is true to the essence values and integrity of a story that is a cornerstone of faith for millions of people worldwide. And they say the biblical story of Noah can be found in the book of Genesis. So that's what Paramount Pictures said about it. And that whole statement from Paramount, I would say, is a lie. <laughs> if you've seen the movie, right? I don't think it's anything to do with the integrity of, of the story we read in Noah. So what I'm going to look at today is flood theology. Flood theology. About the, about the flood and too often people look at the flood from the aspect of flood geology from flood geology 
Uh, and flood, when, I, when I talk about flood geology, something, again, I'm interested in, uh, George McCready Price uh, was a Seventh-day Adventist who wrote material about flood geology early in the 20th century. Uh, there's book, book The uh, Genesis Flood, uh, The Biblical Record and Scientific Implications by John C. Whitcomb and Henry Morris, which was published in 1961. There was, I guess, quite a bit of uh, Ambassador College published material about flood geology uh, around, around the same time. And, and I guess flood geology is kind of a recent study. You know, the, it's only been maybe the past couple hundred years that people have been interested in flood geology. And flood geology is the assertion that the flood can be shown in rock layers throughout the earth. Uh, and I guess with the advent of maybe scientific advances and what we understand about things, I guess it's probably kind of obvious that people would be interested in, in maybe flood geology. But before that, I don't think anyone, you know, they thought of the flood as a geological event to a degree, that they was something you can go out and, and, and look at and study. Are you, are you familiar with Answers in Genesis? There's a, a lot of people here are familiar with Answers in Genesis. And they teach, you know, flood geology. Uh, they're building an Ark Encounter theme park in Kentucky. Have y'all heard of that? You know, that, and that's something that I'm excited about when they, when they build like a life-size replica of, of the Ark. I probably want to go there and visit and, and kind of experience it. And, and, you know, it may not be as accurate. It may be as accurate as that movie Noah, right? <laughs> not, not really sure. But I think it would be pretty cool to go visit a life-size Ark. Uh, Ken Ham, he is the, uh, the founder and the, uh, the lead person at Answers in Genesis, and, he's, and he has this one quote that he always says, which is basically, he says, if Noah's flood were true, you would expect to find millions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. He says, what do we actually see in the fossil record? Millions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Right? <laughs> and that is, that's, that's, that's what flood theology is. And really, and again, it's something I'm interested in, but really the Bible doesn't teach flood geology because uh, the Bible's not a science book. In the same way, the creation account in Genesis is not really a scientific explanation of creation. It's more of what God did and why he did it, and we know that God, God did it. But it is, again, accurate scientifically. And again, we can't even really, we can't, discovered the age of the earth in the Bible, right? There's no place in the Bible where it tells you how old the earth is, and people have different ideas about that. But it does teach flood theology. Flood theology. Again, I'm not saying that geology isn't interesting or something I may talk about later on, but today I want to look at the flood theology. Because I've, I've had plenty of conversations with church folk about the flood, right? Something that we, we're interested in. Heard words like uh, double atmospheric pressure, uh, water canopy, plate tectonics, uh, comets, you know, bringing in water from the flood. There's so very different views of, of flood geology that people, people talk about. And again, it's interesting to me when I look at what Peter has, Peter, Paul, John, Jesus, when they talk about the flood, they never talk about flood layers. Uh, they don't talk about fl plate tectonics. Uh, nothing's mentioned about Pangea. Uh, nothing that they don't mention anything that the flood, you know, about other than that the flood destroys all flesh living on the earth, man and animal. Nothing's mentioned about the Grand Canyon uh, or to what extent the earth was really changed, or, you know, the continents and stuff like that. So again, interesting stuff, but they had something else to say say about about the flood. Uh, you know, some people have, have looked, looked for the ark, and I personally think, this is my, again, this is my personal opinion, that if I was Noah and his offspring, I would have recycled that gopher wood and built other structures out of it. That's what I've always thought. I said, well, you know, we got an ark. Every now it's flooded. We can reuse, reuse this uh, wood to build something else. Some people who study flood ge uh, geology uh, are cunning. Uh, there's people who look for the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, I think a lot of people are seeking proof of God, right? They're, they use these things to seek proof of God. And uh, maybe there's a lot of apologetics about flood geology, right? I mean, 
because you know, again, I've, I've I looked at this myself at times, right? You know, how do we fit 1.5 million species on the ark, right? Or even if it's 10,000 kinds, or what are the ark logistics, right? So if you know, if you go to that museum that are building in that place, they'll give you a lot of that, a lot of the logistics, and a lot of uh, apologetics about how the ark was a real vessel. And, and so I guess a lot of people try to look and, you know, they want to find some proof in that. Maybe they can prove somebody who's a skeptic or somebody's an atheist, right? If I give them this proof, then they'll come and come to start coming to church with me, <laughs> right? But the, but the thing is, that proof is good for us who, who understand and believe in it, but it, it hasn't con convinced anybody else. They usually, they, they keep their atheistic or their anti-God views. So I believe the only proof that we need is the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in, in, the, in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the hearts of the earth. So Christ gave us, you know, if we're looking for proof, right, proof of God, proof of things that are real, the only sign that we need, right, I mean, you know, if I go looking for signs in the rocks, maybe I'm looking in the wrong place. The only sign that we need, not in geology, but it's the fact that Jesus Christ was resurrected. And that's something that we can prove without a shadow of a doubt. It's the most provable historical event that has ever happened. I think, you know, I would say I would, I would be more doubtful that, that, that Lincoln gave the Gettysburg Address than the resurrection of Christ. I said, well, maybe they made that Lincoln thing up. But I know Christ was resurrected. I know that that was a fact. And again, the, the thing about the flood for me is that the flood was a miracle. Right? The flood was a miracle. Do I need a scientific explanation, right, of how, of how Christ turned water into wine? Is there a scientific apologetic of how I can explain how Christ turned water into wine? I was like, I can't think of one. <laughs> I really can't think of how, how that can happen because that's a miracle. Or how he walked on water. I can't think of anything scientifically <laughs> in the physical laws and the ways I look at things that can, can explain walking on water or how he, you know, he fed the multitude. I, I think of, you know, we just came out of Unleavened Bread and I think of the story of Christ feeding the multitudes 5,000 people men at least, and all this bread that they gathered up, is there a scientific explanation? <laughs> right? Is there some kind of apologetic that I can explain how Christ was able to take a few fishes and a few loaves and multiply them? And no, it's a miracle, right? It is a miracle. Uh, how he raised Lazarus from the dead. I don't, you know, I can't find any scientific explanation for, for resurrection. How we will be resurrected. <laughs> I really don't know. Because there aren't any. Because God operates outside of his natural laws. Right? God operates outside of his natural laws. And for me, I'm like, well, why should I expect anything different with the flood, right? So could God fit 1.5 million species on the ark? If he wanted to, of course. Right? Could he put 8 million Certainly, right? Because God, and when we, when we look at this, and, and, and the thing about it is that God had everything to do with this, right? Every aspect of the ark and the flood. And so whatever God wanted to do, which he, which he tells us what he did, right? I, I, there's no reason for me to figure out how he did it. I just know that he did do it, right? He did do it. I think of uh, Doctor Who. You ever watch Doctor Who? Uh, if you, yeah, I'm a real nerd, right? Because I watch Doctor Who. <laughs> All right, so Doctor Who, he had a thing called a TARDIS, which is uh, called a time and relative dimension in space, time machine. And so in Doctor Who, the show Doctor Who outside, it looks like a 1960s uh, London police box, right? And it's probably like four foot by four foot by eight foot. And so in the show, every time he walks into this box, inside is you know, bigger maybe twice this room. And I think, well, could God do that if he wanted to? Sure, God, I'm not saying he did that. I'm just saying God can do whatever because he's God. So again, geology is interesting, but I want to look at the uh, theology behind the flood. So what is the meaning of the flood? And why? Why, why the flood? Why did God have, cause the flood? 
Uh, and so look at Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Begin verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God, so the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be up 120 years. It says there were giants on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Right? And again, Wes White has done some, there's like, we got three or four different sermons that cover all those topics. So I'm not going to talk about giants and all these Nephilim, and there's a lot, there's a lot you can talk about, right? We got that. You can look at that on the web. We have, we have that available. But verse 5, he says, uh, Then the Lord saw, right, this is, and this is the reason for the flood, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually, right? And I think of what Christ said, you know, at the time of the end, will be like the time of Noah. And I don't know if we're there yet, we're, we're you know, because I think there's still a lot of good in this world, and people, you know, not evil continually, but that must have been something, right? <laughs> that, that, that kind of mindset where the thoughts of man was evil continually. In verse 6, and the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And again, I don't believe this is, this is poetical or just there for show. I believe this is saying the way God really felt. When God looked at mankind, you know, he said, man, this, this, you know, this young kid, his plan was to reproduce himself, that we could be part of the kingdom of God. He looked at man, and he was sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was sorry he made us, right? Absolutely sorry that he made us. And so the Lord said in verse 7, I will destroy man who, am, who I, have, I, have, I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air. For I am sorry that I have made them. He says, I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah, verse 8, found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Right? And this was it. This was it. And just, uh, I'm gonna, I keep hearing that noise, so I'm going to say in the back, if you could, this, is that the, was that the noise? Okay. Make sure it wasn't me. All right, good. Gotcha. All right. So this was it. This was it. God was not kidding. If he, had, you know, if if he had went long, if 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 Noah wasn't there, right? And we say thank God for Noah. If if Noah wasn't there, no more mankind, right? And what's the implication of that? I say no resurrection, right? Because we wouldn't have no Christ, right? We have no Christ, no salvation. Like the, the mankind thing, it would, just, it would have ended, right? That's the implication here, that everything would have ended, would have ended. And I think about it, God could have done that instantly, right? I mean, if, if he wanted to, right? I mean, he could have, uh, just like he spoke the word into existence in the world, he could just roll it up like a scroll, right? Like he's going to do in the future, he could just... You know, we'll just get rid of that and we'll, you know, move something else. Right? He could have used fire, uh, poison gas, right? There could have been poison gas and everybody could have died. He could have disintegrated everyone, right? All types of ways, or just made us all disappear, right? There's all types of ways, right, that God could eliminate man from the earth. Man from the earth. All right, Genesis, let's go back to Genesis chapter 5. So we'll put some of this in the context. Genesis chapter 5. And we're going to look at, I think it's verse 28. 
It says, Lamech lived 182 years and had a son. And he called his name Noah, saying, This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. So, so he has something to say about Noah, right? So Noah found grace in God's eyes, and, 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 and this word right from Lamech is, is here for a reason, right? Because it's prophetic about what Noah, through what, what God is going to do in the, with the ark, with the flood, is going to be accomplished. And he says, the ground has been cursed, and that Noah is going to bring... He's going to bring comfort to it. He's going to bring comfort to the ground. And, and the name Noah actually means rest and comfort. And really, and if, and if you start looking at the story, and I won't go into too much of it today, there are some similarities, right, to uh, the Sabbath and, and, and Noah, right? Because, you know, you know, the things that happen, there's similarities about rest and God's rest and what he brings for Noah. Uh, there are parallels with the creation account that we, we can see in, in, in the flood story. And it says here that Noah, it says Noah's going to be the one, right? Again, maybe a type of Christ, right? He pictures a type of Christ, but it really is God, right? Working through what he's going to do with Noah that will bring rest because the ground was cursed. And the word for ground, there's a word, there's a Hebrew word, and that word is adamal, adamal, which literally means soil, ground, really soil, ground, red dirt. That's what, the, what that word means. Or it could, it could mean in a broader sense country, but I think it's really this word specifically means soil, ground, dirt. And so this right here is what was cursed. And we can go to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 3, and verse 17, we can see when the ground was cursed. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. This is after Adam, you know, we know the story of Adam and Eve and how after they, they messed up for us. All right, I mean, they messed up, and here's the story, verse 17. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. So here, you know, so he's talking about Noah's going to bring rest to this, but here's where it happened. He said, Cursed is the ground, that's the same word, Adam, Adamal. And toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorn and thistles it shall bring forth for, for you. And again, you know, we understand that. We have thorns and thistles today, but I think there's something, something different here with, with this curse that maybe we don't exactly know, but, but again, there's something to this. And he says, you shall eat the herb of the field, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, to return to the ground. Right? The same word. You're going to return to the atom, atomal, to the soil. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. I think that's part of the curse, right? It's going to be hard. You're going to have to live off the dirt. And when it's all over, <laughs> you're going to be dirt. Right? That, that, that's the curse that happened, that you will return to the soil. Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, uh, verse 9. After... Cain messes up pretty badly, right? <laughs> I'll tell you that story. We know the story. Cain messes up. Uh, verse 9. It says, And the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Same word, right? And it says, So now you are cursed from the earth. Now right here, the, the word is translated earth, it actually should be ground here. There's another word that's used for earth. So you're cursed from the Adamal, the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. And you think about that, you know, he killed them, and that's where the blood went, into the ground. And he's saying that because of his sins, because of the violence, right, the ground was cursed. The ground... There's something about, there was a connection between the ground, the, the soil, and, and the sin here. Again, uh, it says, verse 12, it says, When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. 
right? You won't get the, full, the fullness out of it, right? It says, a fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. Another example in Exodus 3 about the ground. In Exodus 3, uh, when, when, when God appears to Moses in the, in the burning bush, this is in verse 5, it says, Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground, right? Same word, Adamal, that the ground can be cursed, but if God's presence there, he says the ground that you stand on is holy, holy by his presence. All right, so let's go back to Noah, back to Noah, back to Genesis uh, chapter 6. Uh, let's look at verse 9. It says, this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, right? He was 500 when this happened. And the earth was also corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. Filled with violence. I mean, I, mean, I know we have violence now, but can you just imagine that? It multiplied, right? Everywhere. Violence, murder, mayhem. So God looked upon the earth. Verse 12, and indeed it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth, right? So the ground was cursed, right? And, and, and the sins of man was corrupting, right? The earth, the, the, the planet, the, the soil was filled with the violence of man. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. With the earth. And there's, there's another word for earth uh, that's used, and this is the word eretz. And that word is used right here. And, you know, there's, there's kind of like earth that could be like soil, ground, right? And there's earth here, which is talking about, uh, it can mean like the land, the country, but in the context, it's talking about the entire planet, right? I will destroy them with the planet. Every, everything on it will be destroyed. And so he gives, he gives in, in, in the scriptures here, he gives them the, uh, the length and the cubits and stuff like that. And so that people, when they, when, they, when they build reproductions, and there's several reproductions of the ark around the world you can visit. It's not in the United States yet. But people use these, these uh, dimensions, even the movie, right? The movie, they use those dimensions, and they use the big box, and all right, yeah, well, you got that right. You got the right dimensions on there. And he says, uh, verse 17, And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. Everything will die. And he says, and you shall go into the ark. And he takes, and we know the story, he takes the uh, two of uh, every kind of animal and seven of every clean animal. Verse 22. And thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him. So he did. So let's go to Genesis chapter 7. Genesis 7. You know, he tells, in Genesis 7, he tells them to go into the ark to take all the animals with him. Uh, he tells them in, in verse 4, for after seven more days I will cause it to rain on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights, and I will destroy from the face of the earth. I will destroy from the face of the earth. And then this word, again, this is the word for ground, from the face of the ground, from the soil, from the atomal, I will destroy all living things that I have made. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters were on the earth. Again, this is different from the movie. Because when I watched the movie, uh, you know, in this, Noah's there, he's waiting for the flood. Seven days later, the flood comes. In the movie, he's like karate chopping folks and fighting them as they're trying to <laughs> raid the ark. And this is a big action scene. So that's, that's what the world <laughs> wants to see, right? But, you know, this is the way it, way it happened. Verse 19, and the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. So everything is covered by water. 
Again, the way I think about this, God could have done this any way, right? He could have got rid of mankind all kinds of different ways. But he chose specifically to flood the entire earth and to cover everything to the highest hill completely covered with water. And I believe it's, you know, a miracle. God can do it. I don't have to tell you where the water came from or where it went. God, God did this. And, you know, and it's a fact, right, because Christ said so. So water covers everything. In verse 21, it says, And all flesh died the move on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And every man, and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, all that was on the dry land, the Adam all, had died. And it says, uh, and the waters prevailed, and so forth. So the effect of the flood was universal, right? Every living thing, and it specifically says, you know, repeatedly, on the ground, right? And we got, I got to assume in the oceans, well, they were swimming around. God took care of that, right? People have problems. There's apologetics for it. Doesn't matter, right? God took care of it. They're still here. We still have whales and, and such. All right, Genesis 8, verse 1. Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided. And the fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. And the waters receded continually from the earth. And at the end of the 150 days, the waters decreased. And the ark rested in the seventh month, the 17th day of the month, on the mountains of Ararat. And I, think, I think it's kind of interesting that it was the seventh month. The ark rests, right? There's rest. It's coming. Noah's, Noah's name means rest. And again, and, and it's kind of looked to the rest that we get from who? From Christ. There's, there's so much in here. That kind of looks forward in what, what is happening, and we'll see. Because I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to show you some of what uh, Peter has to say about it. Some other folks have to say about here, and, and what what's actually what God was doing. And so they they get out of the, uh, they leave the ark, and every animal they get out, and they all the, all the creepy things, and they go every which way. Verse twenty. Verse twenty. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. And took of every clean animal and every clean burn offered burnt offerings, burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a smoothing aroma. And the Lord said in his heart, I will never again, right? So again, this is, this is I guess, the effect. What, it says, I will never again curse the ground, the atom all, for man's sake. So, so whatever the extent of that curse is, we still have what we deal with, with the ground, right? Whatever that extent was, that was removed, right? That curse was removed. Although the imagination of the man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done, right? And, you know, we, and, that, and that curse of the ground, because we will return to the ground, but what are we kind of guaranteed now? As a Christian, we're guaranteed resurrection, and then... I see there's a resurrection for everybody else. You know, so there's, we're not, we're, we're not going to be left in the ground. And again, God establishes the covenant rainbow in, in, there in, in the rest of the chapter. So rest was brought to the earth, to the ground, to the land. So all, and again, so think about it, all the sin, the violence that the former evil culture, right, all that, all that was there, that culture was gone, right? When they got out of the ark, all that evil, the entire culture, and, and, and I try to try to think about what was that culture like. I've heard estimates of one billion to eleven billion people on the earth before the flood. The one thing, the one thing that I liked about the movie Noah, <laughs> the one thing is that they, they the, the culture was an industrial society. I said, well, yeah, that, that probably could happen, right? We don't know. It got washed away. You know, because uh, there's, there's books out there about the pre-flood world that are steampunk, where everything in the pre-flood world runs on steam and such. And, you know, there's like a whole book series you can see at the Christian bookstores about that. You know, I myself, I like to think of the pre-flood world the way many people have thought about it over the years when people have, like, uh, drawn paintings and 
thought about what, what, what was this evil world like, they kind of drew it in, the, in terms of their own world and how they were describing it and some of the paintings and things like that. And I kind of think it was like my own world. What if it was like this? You know, not saying it was. I'm just saying I don't really know. <laughs> don't know what it was like, but that it was, cont- it was completely evil. And the, and the point is that world, that, con- that evil world, was washed away. Completely washed away, utterly destroyed. And I don't think you know people look for archaeology of the pre. I don't. So it's really I, God's. It's, it's been washed away. It's hard to find that archaeology of, of the pre-flood. Because I don't think God wants us to know how evil they really were. Because we actually could find out. You know, it may rub off. It may. It may I mean, I don't know. It, it, was, it was just sinful. Sinful. So let's look at First Peter chapter three. First Peter chapter three. Verse 18. It says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, by, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited. It says, In the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. And a lot of times we don't really think about that. That the, you know, a lot of people, the, the, I hear atheists say, man, how could God just kill everybody in the world? That was just terrible. You know, and, and and, 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 and always when people look for flood evidence, right, they're looking for destruction and, and, and chaos and things. But the thing is, the flood was about saving. The flood was about salvation. Because you know, God could have done either way, but he, the flood was made to wash away the old world and to save Noah and his family. It says the eight souls, they were saved through that water. And it says there is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, right? And that baptism is really related. You know, it relates to Israel when they walked through the, uh, when, the, when, when, the when the sea was parted, right? That, that, that we, can, we can read where that was related to baptism. He says there is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone to heaven is at the right hand of God. Angels and dories and powers have been made subject to him. So again, the flood, and in my mind, I kind of think of it being destruction, but it's not destruction. The flood was salvation, right? Because, because of that flood, Noah lived, people lived, Christ died for us. Again, I'm so grateful that God Showed grace to Noah because by showing grace to Noah, what was he showing grace to? To us, to all of mankind, that he would that he would give us a savior, that he would give us a savior. You know, and when we're baptized, right? We're kind of we kind of leave the old world in, in a sense. There's an old world that we are a part of, kind of like maybe the pre-flood world. I think you know, there's, there's an old world that we are a part of, and when we go into the waters of baptism. We hopefully, right, we leave our old world behind us and we enter into the new world, which is governed by what? God's laws. You know, we're not in the kingdom technically, right, but we still live by the laws of the kingdom and we have a king. And so we, so we're, so we are part of that new world, that new thing that God is doing. And we know, really, we really know in part. And I guess we are kind of, and I guess maybe, maybe one reason that we can all relate to Noah, and I find the story of Noah, is that I think we're all kind of like modern Noahs in a way, right? Because God, God he found, there's something he saw, just like he saw in Noah, that he gave Noah grace, but he decided to give us grace too, right? He said, I said, that I don't know, I'm, and I'm, I'm so grateful that God looked at me and said, I want to give Jeff some grace, <laughs> or I want, you know, I want to give, I want to give some, some grace to you, and that grace 
through Christ that we can be baptized. We can be removed from the, from the world, right? Because the world, I don't know if it's as bad as it was at Noah's time, but it's pretty, you know, getting pretty bad, right? Because I think of like the earth, the, the ground being corrupt, and I think of abortion. I think of what does abortion do to, you know, figuratively or, you know, really, does that really, does that corrupt our ground? Does that cause problems? Does it, yeah, I, I would, does, it, does it curse the ground? The, the violence that we do with, say, abortion or, or some of the filth that we have in, our, in that land or the violence we have in the world and wars and the things that we do to each other. I don't like reading the news. Y'all like reading the news? I mean, I read the news and I get like, man, there's some, some, th- some terrible things happen. Uh, and again, um, there's a story I have here that's probably typical of what happens a lot. And you may have heard the story or not, but I, I think about the time of Noah, and I think about the ground, I think about the, the old world, I think about what will happen. It's like this is happening now. And there, this happened in Maryland. Uh, and I don't really know when it happened, I just have the story. And again, it kind of makes me think of the pre-flood world, think of the evils. And there was two teenage girls uh, who were aged uh, 17 and 15, and they were bullying, bullying an autistic 16-year-old boy into performing uh, certain acts. I won't go into the detail, but they, they were making them do these terrible things and acts, and they were recording it on their cell phones. Uh, and they were making him walk around on a frozen pond. Uh, when he would follow in, they would just laugh at him. And they were just abusing him. And again, I, you know, I, I know that men can be cruel. And, and, and when I start hearing about young teenage girls doing these cruel acts, and, 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 I, and, I, and I read, you know, we see this in the news. It seems like, right, at least in, in, in my mind, that there's, I mean, it's, 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 this world is increasing. There is increasing violence. Can imagine everybody like that, right? Everybody with that kind of heartless thing. I think that would be like the time of Noah, where everyone is that heartless that they would just treat people and abuse them and and do those type of things and just laugh at it. And again, you know, are we in the end times? Right, that's a question that we ask. And and I've talked to a lot of people in the church, and they believe it. Right, that we're in the end times. And I really don't know. But for some reason, I feel like I am, right? There's something that makes me feel like we're in the end times. But I think, you know, the church has always felt that way. When I, when I read for people who've written stuff for the last couple of thousand years, they've always felt like they're in the end times because we're like Noah, right? We're, we're trying, we're, we want to live a righteous life. We want to live by, by what Jesus Christ has for us in this world. And we see the sins of the world, and it kind of makes us long even hard, you know, more for the kingdom of God, right? So I think, I think a lot of us have felt that way. So I don't really know. Don't really know. 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Verse 1. It says, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will sing, secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who, who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. So this is talking about what happened then, what happens through history, what happens now. Verse 2, and many will follow the destructive ways. Right? And I, and I see that the people have had their ways. There's people, so many of our role models in the world are people that people shouldn't be following, <laughs> honestly. And they do some terrible things, and, and it gets, gets worse what they try to, uh, to, to get away with and what they do. It says, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. Well, and I, I, you know, it, it upsets me when I, when, when, I, when I turn on television and a cartoon show will blaspheme God. <laughs> and there's TV shows in prime time, cartoon shows blaspheming God. Or in news broadcasts, people blaspheme God. So I, we see these things. It says, by covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. Uh, for a long time, their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. Verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them in the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world... 
but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, and turning the you know and so and he gives the, also the example of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Because again, this is the way God could have done it. He could have did it the way Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. That was a by fire, right? He says, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them to destruction, making them an example to those who would afterward live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. I guess Lot, you know, Lot, Lot and Noah are some kind of parallels between the, those two guys. You know, because Lot, he says, for that righteous man Lot, dwelling among them, tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. You know, we think of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And God had to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. I, I believe that if, if had they had been left to, to go about their violence, their evils that they were doing, they would have influenced the world pretty quickly. And it probably would have been just like the days of Noah pretty quick because of those very influential cities. And God's, you know, he took care of it at that time. Verse 9, it says, And the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of the temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. And especially those who walk according to the flesh and the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. Whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord before the Lord so there's a there's a you know there's there's a, there's a day coming I mean I, I can look in Revelation right and I see some things that look pretty bad to me I mean again I'm not a prophet I don't you know maybe there's some prophets in here I, but I look at it and you know, when it says you know a third of the earth or a quarter of the earth and people are and things happen it's like well, that's, that's some pretty bad stuff right that's the judgment of God that's coming I, mean, I don't know if it's soon or whenever it's coming it's going to come at some point right because of because of mankind, because you know God God is is saving mankind, and He has to save to save us from that evil world, right? From the the world, because we have a kingdom of God coming. Because right, don't we know the world needs to repent, don't it? <laughs> and again, I think of I give Noah a preacher of righteousness, right? I think of what maybe maybe hopefully our lives are that way in the in the world maybe how we live that we can at least try to be righteous in in in, in, in this in this world because we we've we have we have been fortunate right to come to Christ come to Christ right because He is our ark right Christ is our ark and I think about it Christ was Noah's ark <laughs> right because He's the one I say He He took care of it all for Noah. Right, I don't think Noah had to really, I mean, he probably gave him all the engineering plans, but you know what? If there was a hole or something, God would have took care of that, right? Christ took care of Noah, right? He delivered him, he washed, he washed away the world and gave him the cleansing of the world. He gave him salvation. Christ is our ark, he's our safety, he's our rest. Our salvation out of this world. Our salvation, right, from the curse of sin, right? Because that, that curse that was, was lifted in the flood, right, that, that was a sin, the sin curse. He is our salvation, right, from that curse of sin. The curse of being in the ground, right? You know, I, I don't have to, you know, read in 1 Corinthians 15, right? We, I mean, through Christ, we will be resurrected. We will be resurrected. And, and, and that's the tremendous, tremendous lifting of a curse, isn't it? He instructs us how to be righteous. And he gives us so, so much grace. So much grace from God. So, so, when I, so that's why I like the story of Noah, because it's a, it's, a, it's a story of salvation. A story of, uh, that we can relate to. Because now, you know, our salvation is in Christ, and we... Even though the world may look difficult, right? Because, you know, things look difficult. Things look like I have no idea, <laughs> right? I have no idea what I would do if, when some of that stuff starts happening, right? It doesn't matter, right? We put our faith in Christ. 
He will always deliver us. Exploring current global conditions along with the latest social trends, the Armor of God asks the question, what are the solutions to our broken world? Right here every week, new perspectives are presented for your consideration by our commentators. The Armor of God challenges you to be vigilant in your outlook and understanding of this world in these tumultuous times. Don't miss this week's program.